couple points during this State of the Union, I thought, wonder what Baker is thinking about this. And um, you've written a couple things. You've written about um, the impact that uh, a ten dollar and uh, ten cent minimum wage uh, might have on the poverty numbers. And you also wrote that um, uh, anyone who thinks a ten dollar and ten cent minimum wage is too high should consider that from 1938 to 68 we raised the minimum wage in step with productivity growth. Now I've quoted you on this a couple times. What does that mean? It mean uh, can you just explain in layman's terms for a minute what we did for those 30 years and what we've done since and why it matters? Yeah, well, well, the distinction, a lot of people have been focused on what the minimum wage was in 1968. That was its high point, and they've been talking about restoring its purchasing power, which would be a bit over $10 an hour, somewhere in that neighborhood. So what that would mean is that someone working an hour in 2014, if we were to do it tomorrow, would be able to buy basically the same basket of goods and services, or an equivalent basket, I should say, to what they bought with an hour's worth of work back in, in, in 1968. Now, the point I was making here is if you go back, we first instituted the federal minimum wage in 38. From 1938 to 1968, the minimum wage just didn't keep constant in terms of purchasing power. It actually rose basically in step with the economy's ability to produce. So as we got more productive, as we were able to produce more in an hour of work, more goods and services, workers at the bottom, minimum wage workers, shared in that increase so that their wages basically moved in step with economic growth. They got their share of economic growth. So what I was saying here is let's imagine that continued. We did that from 38 to 68, when I should point out the unemployment rate was under 4%. We did that for 30 years. Suppose we had continued to do that for the next 45 years. Today, the minimum wage would be around $17 an hour. So if we continued that practice, we'd be looking at a minimum wage that's more than twice as high as what it is today. So now, just so that I understand and our audience understands, what happened in 1968 to change that? Was the law rewritten? Did something else happen? Well, it was never under law that it followed that. That was a practice. So Congress repeatedly raised the minimum wage, as it has often done since. We went a long period where we didn't. The Reagan era, we didn't have any increases at all. But we all, when we did have increases, what we were at best trying to do was restore the purchasing power. So we never had it in the law that the minimum wage would track productivity growth. It was just, in effect, the practice that when we raised the minimum wage every few years, we were doing it to, in such a way that workers at the bottom got their share of economic growth. So, And when we did, you were saying, among other things, the economy, can, obviously there were many other factors, but it certainly didn't prevent the economy from growing, nor did it prevent, you know, the common argument is that if we increase the minimum wage, it will increase unemployment, people won't be able to uh, hire new workers, but in 1968, the unemployment rate, uh, rate was roughly half what it is today, and I think that's your point. Um, so the president is proposing 1010, which will put it, I gather more or less in line with changes in purchasing power. Um, but I'll start with a personal question. When you hear some of the arguments against a position like this made over and over again, despite the fact that they've been disproven historically, argued against logically, and defeated in a number of different ways, I've asked Krugman this question. I've asked uh, Bill Black this question. How do you keep from going nuts? <laughs> You know, you, you, you're in this long enough. I've been, you know, in D.C. over well over 20 years in policy debates. You ju you just get used to it. I mean, you know, I, I I I'm constantly amazed how people can make arguments that are often utterly absurd. I, I just was defending Krugman the other day because they were saying he was calling for Greenspan to to have a housing bubble. Well, I. I was very happy back in 2002. I got Krugman to write a piece warning about the housing bubble. Um, you know, utter nonsense. But, you know, just to give you another example that comes up all the time. There's this whole crew running around Washington that we have to worry about the retirees. You know, our, our baby boomers are retiring and it's going to bankrupt our children and grandchildren. At the same time, and in some cases, the same people, we're supposed to be worried that robots are going to throw us all out of work and there won't be any jobs. Going, well, you could have one or the other of those as at least a logical possibility. In other words, we could at least logically have a story where we have, you know, all these retirees and no one working. You know, we're all waiting around for someone to change our bedpan. You could also logically have the story that there are no jobs because the robots are doing everything. You can't right, they're both. changing the bedpans. The exactly. robots are changing. Exactly. Um, but we have people in Washington, prominent people, or I should say very serious people, who will make those two arguments simultaneously. 
Well, you know, it's fascinating. Be <laughs> well, sure. <laughs> I guess. Um, well, are the robots? First of all, uh, look, I, I got to ask you this question because you know, I, I think when it comes to robots and technology, there there are two arguments. One is that they've already taken our jobs, so don't expect us to put people whack back to work. The other is that everything is going to change when they do take our jobs. And I also ask myself, well, which is it? Um, but, uh, what, uh, you know, this report's gone around saying that uh, um, uh, the new study, British study of American jobs, saying 49% will be eliminated by automation. Um, what do you think of that? Uh, go, just looking forward for a second. I mean, you're absolutely right about the contradiction, but as long as robots came up, what do you think about uh, the real impact of automation going forward? Do we even know? Well, we, we, we don't know. I mean, first off, there's no evidence to date. Productivity growth is actually slowed, not sped up. This is productivity growth. People talk about it like it's some, something alien. We've had productivity growth for, you know, centuries, and that's what it is. It's a form of productivity growth, but that's what we're talking about. And the data actually show productivity growth has slowed in the last five years. I don't necessarily expect that to continue, but just, you know, if we're just looking at the data, it, it goes the wrong way. But but the other point is, what what does this mean? Let's say we saw more rapid productivity growth. Well, in principle, that should make us wealthier. And to say we're going to destroy jobs, you got to remind these guys in Britain, a job is not a fixed amount of time. People used to work six and a half days a week. They put in 70 hours a week. We got down to a 40-hour work week back in, in uh, the 30s with the Fair Labor Standards Act, same act actually created the minimum wage. Um, in Europe, they continue to have shortening of the work, in some cases work week, also work year, uh, five weeks uh, a year of vacation is standard, many countries have six, paid family leave. Uh, the, the idea that we're going to be made poor by technology is nuts. Now, the, by how we govern that technology, the rules we put in place, that can make us poor. But the idea we should fear the technology is crazy. We might want to fear the people who are controlling the technology, but not the technology.